book, You Must Change Your Life, Peter Slaughterdyke argues that there is no such thing as religion and never has been. Indeed, Slaughterdyke insists there is only what he calls the practicing human. In this framework, man himself produces man, not through work as Marxists would have it, but through life in forms of practice. There is nothing specifically or inherently religious about the practice in human, since humans have always been engaged in self-disciplinary techniques of improvement and transformation, whether under the guidance of a master or one's own ascetic impositions. Writers, farmers, yogis, philosophers, artists, educators, monks, all share in common the fact that they are acrobats walking tightropes and performing feats of near impossible difficulty that astonish the rest of us and further the transformation of the human being into something greater than himself. With Shakti, I had put myself into contact with very vertical tensions, ideas of God, the One, the Tao, the Good, the Divine, Shakti, herself, The phrase, oceanic feeling, refers to a sensation of eternity, a feeling of being one with the external world as a whole, a feeling of something limitless, unbounded, as it were, oceanic. Freud first discussed what he called the oceanic feeling, a non-dual experience, in his book, Civilization and Its Discontents. He argues that the oceanic feeling, if it exists, is the preserved primitive ego feeling from infancy. He deemed it a fragmentary vestige of a kind of consciousness possessed by an infant who has not yet differentiated themselves from other people and things. This primitive ego feeling precedes the creation of the ego and exists up until the mother ceases breastfeeding. In placing the oceanic feeling as the earliest stage in development, Freud depicts non-dual awareness as infantile. The very ego that Freud wanted us to hang on to was, according to Carl Jung and many others, neither in control nor whole. Jung would suggest it is not the ego that is in control, but other forces, archetypes, myths, delusions. Far from a knowing, self-aware, self-possessed ego, our personages are in the vice of other strange forces. And it is this awareness we bring back to our sense of self from these other states, be it grief, bliss, almost dying, psychedelics, exhilaration. Stangroff studied as a psychiatrist and had gone through many years of psychoanalysis. Like many others, he began to feel that Freud had missed something in his view of religion. Of religion, Freud wrote, the whole thing is so patently infantile, so foreign to reality, that to anyone with a friendly attitude to humanity, it is painful to think that the great majority of mortals will never be able to rise above this view of life. In reducing religion to ritual, Groff felt Freud completely missed that at the cradle of every major religion is a direct, visionary experience of some other realities which he would go on to call transpersonal experiences. An early researcher into the new drug LSD 
at the Psychiatric Research Institute in Prague, Groff would assist in over 4,500 LSD sessions with patients and discover it would give them direct access to the depths of their unconscious. LSD, he said, function for the understanding of psychology as the telescope did for astronomy or the microscope for biology. He said, I realized people were not having LSD experiences. They were having experiences of themselves, but they were coming from depths that psychoanalysis didn't know anything about. Groff was one of the few psychiatrists in the 50s, like R.D. Lang in the 60s, who realized one couldn't fully understand the psyche within the science's materialist paradigm. He felt the Western traditional scientific framework was too rational-bound and ethnocentric and wholly dismissive of non-ordinary states of consciousness. Like Lang, he would argue, in this dismissiveness, the West had missed out on some of the richest experiences of human history, those of saints, prophets, mystics, shamans, entire cultures and communities. From a rational perspective, they were ambulant psychotics. Groff was asking the question, if you change your consciousness, if you go into a different state of consciousness, how might you experience yourself? How might you experience the universe? And what kind of insights might you get into as to who you are and what it's all about? In these non-ordinary states of consciousness, he observed, one's identity boundaries dissolve, and one discovered that who they thought they were, their sense of self, was not an absolute state. At the beginning of his research, he thought each patient would come up with their own unique cosmology because each person was different and so expected that they would think about these things differently. But over time, conducting so many, many sessions, he found the feelings and sensations under these states were very similar and he came to believe, like Joseph Campbell, Carl Jung, Rudolf Steiner and others, they were coming from the collective unconscious. In other words, many of these experiences mapped similar territories, and it was a territory that others in the world were mapping as well. So in 1967, Groff, now an MD with a PhD in philosophy of medicine, came to the States to Johns Hopkins University, and in the early 70s became a scholar in residence at Esalon. He would attend conferences on science and spirituality, and began to observe a convergence of very similar pictures of our place, our psyche, and the cosmos. What he found was that people in psychedelic sessions had similar kinds of experiences as did yogis and those working with the breath. In these states, the participants often had experiences of the void. And the void was exactly what quantum physicists had come to, the dynamic void and probabilities. Everything ultimately being just probabilities, but nothing is really manifested until it's observed. In these non-ordinary states, people talk about a supercosmic and metacosmic void, an emptiness that is superordinated to everything and in some sense underlies everything. In Buddhist scriptures, form is emptiness, and emptiness is form, a non-ordinary state of consciousness which is a state of absolute metaphysical emptiness, of nothingness, there's nothing there. Yet this nothingness is conscious of itself. There is a point of consciousness that's aware of that emptiness. And paradoxically, there is also the sense that there's nothing missing in that state. There's potential for all of existence, but none of it is concretized in any way. This, at the gut level of existence, the source of existence comes from nothing. People he found who have powerful experiences of the void, who experience death and rebirth, who relive
lived their birth. People, he found, who have powerful experiences of the void, who experience death and rebirth, who relive their birth, emerge with a new philosophy, which is different from a Western one, and so feel a tremendous resonance with things like the I Ching, Taoism, Vedanta type of thinking. And so he asked, once having this insight, how is it that we reconcile these ordinary and non-ordinary states of consciousness? This was the same question asked of the human potential movement and asked today.